Hello there and welcome to episode two in this brand new podcast series. Ox Talks, powered by Oxlep, the local enterprise partnership for Oxfordshire, is new for 2023 with the aim of giving you more insight into the great work that Oxlep does, helping businesses right across Oxfordshire and beyond add value to their organisation and crucially to the communities they serve. I'm Howard Bentham, and over the coming editions, I'll be meeting some key characters in the county, finding out how they're influencing businesses to be better, and how the support that is available from Oxlep might also be crucial in helping your company or organisation progress as well. Although, of course, we're focusing on Oxfordshire's businesses and issues in this series, if you're listening to us in the surrounding counties or even in another part of the UK, Many of the difficulties we experience here will be very similar to the ones that you are facing where you are. So do share your thoughts, stories and observations with us, plus crucially the solutions to the problems that you've found. Social media is a natural home for this and we can pick up on your comments and questions in forthcoming podcasts. We are at Oxfordshire Lep on Twitter and Oxfordshire Local Enterprise Partnership on LinkedIn and we look forward to hearing from you. In this edition, we are discussing Destination Oxfordshire and if tourism is, in actual fact, the key sector for all sectors. Is a successful tourism and leisure industry the crucial component in the mix that enables every part of the local economy to have the chance to prosper? With major retail locations, an award-winning World Heritage Site and being based in an area of outstanding natural beauty, Oxfordshire has a visitor economy offer like no other. But like all four corners of the globe following the pandemic, the county's tourism industry has suffered from a marked lack of footfall. Working with its local destination management organisations, Oxlep has recently launched a new programme aimed at promoting Oxfordshire as a staycation of choice in the UK. But is there more we should be doing collectively? In this podcast, we find out why the county's visitor economy must be supported and highlight its significance to the wider economic picture. So on Ox Talks, it's time to meet another inspiring business leader. In this edition, we'll hear the thoughts of the man who has the incredible role of being the custodian of the county's World Heritage Site. With us is the CEO of Blenheim Palace, Dominic Hare. Dominic, you've been at Blenheim for what, uh, nearly 20 years now. Do you still get that wow fact? To be honest, when you get out of the car and you park it up in the car park and you walk into the office, do, do you still go, whoa, look at this? Yes, I, I'm very lucky. My, my office is at the Woodstock town gate. And so we park there. And if you walk through that gate, you get that famous finest view in England, looking across the park, the lake, Grand Bridge, and then the palace rising in the distance and especially this time of year when you get a hard frost the whole thing shimmers in the air and it is breathtaking and sometimes i mean to take five seconds just to remind myself i'm a lucky boy and then several minutes later i feel that guilty thing i better go to the office now and 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 (laughs) we 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 welcome new staff all the time and especially some of our younger apprentices it's often their first job and you have this moment a few months in where you know they've got used to it they're they're, they're pretty settled they're getting good at their job and they're starting to think about the future and you have to actually remind them that not all workplaces are quite like this one and you see this dawning horror on their faces as they they realize that those box things in the middle of cities that people have to go and work in those uh, and and they suddenly realize what a special place it is and it is it, 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 it's 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 an utter blessing to work there and the need the compulsion to share it is written into all of us it's, it flows in our veins because it's so stunning let's rewind your 20 years past those 20 years at Blenheim your background's actually in banking and that's a one hell of a leap for a, a director of Parry Bar and Barclays Bank in the city to running a 300-year-old palace in the Oxfordshire Sticks. It was a leap, although I think it's probably more graduated than that story implies. I, I joined Blenheim as its first finance director, and I had a finance background, even if it wasn't inside a business running it. And I think they saw in me uh, a, a, an entrepreneurial spark that they felt would fit the first ever 
incarnation of that role, which was very brave of them. I'm not sure I would hire someone for a job who had zero experience in that kind of job before, but they they chose to, which is which is very good of them. And then we've seen a progression at Blenheim by no means down to me, but that 20 years is not 20 years of going in and doing the same job. You know, Blenheim has grown from a relatively small visitor attraction and a small visitor business and a bit of farming and things like that through to a much larger business making a much more dramatic impact on the area and and we've added sort of house building we've multiplied the size and scale of, of the visitor attraction by three or four we've multiplied the restoration program by a factor of 10 many things have changed over that time and so i don't really feel that i've been in the same job for more than three or four years at a time and and at all stages the, the team at Blenheim and the board at Blenheim and the family have backed us to continue to have the highest impact we can have. So it's been a wonderful, joyful progression. And when people remind me that it's almost 20 years, I have to do a start and do the mental arithmetic. Don't be, don't be ridiculous. That can't be, <laughs> oh, my word. <laughs> You're right. The, the grey hairs give it away a little. Uh, <laughs> Give us a quick history lesson for those listening to this uh, edition who are not familiar with Blenheim and how it sits today as a World Heritage Site. Pure luck. Uh, let's go back 300 years. Uh, actually, the park that you'd recognise today as Blenheim Park was a royal hunting lodge, so it was used occasionally by royalty. There was an old Woodstock palace there, which doesn't exist today. There's a stone that marks the spot. Uh, then, in 1704... Uh, a young man gets an opportunity, and it's not really a gilt-edged opportunity. This is John Churchill, who was the first Duke, who essentially got a call from the Queen to say, you know the invincible almighty armies of Louis XIV uh, that stand astride Europe? Um, would you mind taking an English army across Europe and confronting them on the battlefield, please? And it, it, it doesn't sound particularly attractive. Uh, John was a, a, a brilliant leader. Uh, he he has so many firsts to his name. But to cut the story short, he crosses Europe in record time. The, the provocation is that, that Louis XIV is astride Europe. He's about to place his nephew on the Spanish throne, and that would have meant essentially Europe was French and we would be speaking French. Um, John crosses Europe in record time, confronts his army, uh, the armies of Louis XIV at a village called Blindheim, which English soldiers allegedly couldn't pronounce, hence Blenheim. And even though he's outnumbered by a factor of five to one or something like that, he defeats the French absolutely. And in fact, the war of the Spanish succession, of which this was the first major battle, is settled in that moment. The next 10 years are spent John moving around Europe, defeating the French in every single territory they're in, in every form of warfare you can imagine, from siege warfare to running battles to guerrilla warfare in woodlands. He simply defeats them absolutely. And eventually the French, having been pushed back inside their frontiers, sue for peace. And John is rewarded by Parliament and Queen Anne with the Royal Hunting Park, and with a sum of money, £240,000 old money, to build a palace. And then, a hundred or so years after that, another man is born there, by chance. His name is Winston Churchill. When I say he's born there by chance, he is the son of the younger brother of the Duke. Um, the parents, expecting Winston to be born, had travelled back towards their home in London, where the decorators had overrun in painting the nursery, essentially. And so the house wasn't ready. They diverted to Blenheim. And depending on the account you read, either his mother danced too vigorously at the dance or rode too vigorously in the hunt. But one way or another, Winston, probably the most famous Briton, was born at Blenheim Palace. And these this sequence of luck in some ways means that Blenheim holds an almost unrivaled position of fame in, in that sense. And it sits right in the centre of England. And the final piece of luck for us as a set of businesses is that spot isn't in the middle of nowhere. It's right in the centre of England. It's an hour from London. It's an hour from Birmingham. It's on the tourist road from the historic city of Oxford to Stratford, two of the most visited locations in the country. And of course, more recently, it's a 10 minute drive from a shopping outlet called Bister Village. So we are absolutely collectively the heart of tourist England. And we run a tourist business in the middle of that. 
I tell you, if uh, Oxlet branch out into history podcasts, Dominic, I, I think you might have the gig. Uh, right up to date, the LinkedIn page, the Blenheim LinkedIn page, really caught me by surprise. It says, we aim to be the lifeblood of the local economy and to enhance the lives of local people. Not a single me uh, mention of palaces, grandeur, 300 years of history, Churchill, anything. Uh, and that, that really struck me. Develop that really uh, for us, if, if you could, what that statement means. Well, I would step back one move from that and say, yeah, like any business, we try to find what is our unique raison d'etre, what is unreplicatable about us, where are we really playing, playing to our strengths. And at its core, I think there's a permanence in the location of a landed estate, which is what we are, just north of Woodstock, um, so, and, and north of Oxford. We will be there in 300 years' time. Pretty much no other business can say that with certainty. And that means we can do things like invest for the ultra long term in that space, completely sure that our successors, successors, successors will be there to reap the benefits. It doesn't matter whether we're investing into the palace and park or into new housing or 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 into the way we manage the land we will be there to reap the benefit and no other business can really say that um, so there are other institutions that have that permanence of location if you take a district or a county council well it will be there they can't invest they're not really allowed to so we sit at this unique crossroads where we can invest for the very long term in a place and that even allows us to do work entirely for good you know if we spend money helping a school or building community facilities or or setting up training anything like that in many of these respects you can't say we will ever make a pound back for it but if but if we are the biggest landowner stakeholder employer in that area it's clearly to our benefit that people living in that area have great facilities around them so we we, we get that payback too and so we take that line of thought and say what's unique about us is that long-term connection that means if we follow a purpose that says we'll be the lifeblood of the local economy will enhance the lives of local people and will share and protect this extraordinary place. That's a great way of summing up that long-term connection. And clearly, as the biggest owner of things in that place, if this area becomes more and more economically vibrant, we will benefit. If people want to move to the area and bring up their children there because they see there are nice homes, that's a great cultural backdrop, we offer the greatest training opportunities around they'll want to live there, they'll want to live in our houses or live in houses like our houses. Uh, yeah, there's so much of a virtuous circle about what we do, but we do bottle down that general purpose into 10 goals, which are much more specific and transparent about what we intend to do and why. And, and very quickly, these are 10 goals in 10 years. We start off by wanting to treble our contribution to the local economy, to train 100 apprentices or more in life-changing skills to build 300 truly affordable homes to grow the visitor attraction to be net zero across the whole estate to be a top employer to to conduct and finish a 40 million pound restoration program to bring back some of the lost art collections and start another one to build a permanent 45 million pound endowment to protect the world heritage site forever and to double the value of our contribution to the community these are very specific promises that we all our businesses contribute to some some in different ways you know uh, our, our house building and property businesses clearly do almost all the delivery on truly affordable homes whereas all of our businesses contribute enthusiastically to training young people because they can and it's just a glorious entry part of and we have very different businesses from from mineral water production to visitor attractions and retail and weddings to house building to affordable homes to growing new forests to sequester carbon, to promoting solar energy. We have this running right across our businesses, but each of those businesses tie back to this permanent collection, connection to our place, to this desire to enhance the local economy, enhance the lives of local people, and to share this incredible place. Let's explore the wider visitor economy in Oxfordshire. You're also a director at Experience Oxfordshire. Again, worth uh, just contexting for people listening their role and relevance in this? So Experience Oxfordshire is the destination management and marketing organisation that's, that's supported by all our local authorities, by Oxlep and by pretty much all the major tourist businesses in the area. There are some things which we do better together and couldn't realistically do apart. So we have a wonderful team at Experience Oxfordshire led by Hayley Beargamage and they do everything from promote Oxfordshire as a whole 
across the world and they really do go across the world promoting us very specifically for things like business tourism for um, big group international tourism uh, they also increasingly and this, this is something that stepped up really in the pandemic market oxygen as a hub in the UK as domestic tourism became a lot more important. They also provide an essential amount of business support that tourist businesses need. And, and perhaps as a very large tourist business, we need it rather less than others, but there are plenty of small, crucial components down to you know, every last bus driver, to every owner of a cafe, to every provider of bed and breakfast accommodation, to those many small visitor attractions who will never feature in advertising on the far side of China, um, providing business support for them. And that was particularly important in the pandemic. They bring all of that together under one roof. And, and, and the sad reality is we don't really get national government support for tourism anymore. There is some Visit Britain and Visit England style spend. But apart from that, we're on our own as a community. Let's have a look at the, the recovery then. The visitor economy was worth around 10% gross value added in Oxfordshire prior to the pandemic. Where are we now? Are we recovered? Uh, we're not fully recovered. I, I think the prediction for next year is that in nominal pound terms, we'll reach the same pounds of contribution in 2023. However, if you take inflation into account, that is probably still a 10% shortfall in real terms next year. Uh, I think the we, we, Oxfordshire does very well from international tourism. If you think about the sort of golden triangle of the, the historic university city of Oxford, of Bicester Village and of Blenheim Palace, then those are three very well recognized brands. Um, even if you go to the far side of China, to cities that I could barely name, um, these are very recognized brands. That international tourism has not rebounded yet. In particular, and Blenheim is probably quite typical in these proportions, if 20% of our normal audience is international, half of that is Chinese. And that Chinese audience has only just started traveling, I'd say in the last few weeks, as, as of course the, the, the national government, the Communist Party there lifted travel restrictions. Uh, a big theme for the next two years is you know, so-called revenge tourism, which is people revenge going out tourism. and absolutely <laughs> taking advantage of the opportunities they've not been able to take advantage of in the last two, three years. But I do think it will take two years for that market to come back. So 23, towards the end of 24, summer 24 onwards, maybe you'll be back at real normal volumes. What about the public confidence here then, post-COVID? Are, are people feeling confident enough to come out or is now the cost of living crisis the thing that's hurting people? It's, it's, an, interesting, it's an interesting one to debate. Um, if I look at Blenheim Palace's tourism figures, uh, we are now very close to being at 2019 levels in volume terms, and we are ahead of 2019 in pound terms. Uh, just to pluck some stats from the air, uh, in the year to March 2020, so a little bit affected by pandemic right at the end, you know, our contribution measured to the economy was about £120 million. In the year to March 22, we'd risen, there'd been a V-dip between, to about £135 million. And the same is true in terms of jobs supported by Blenheim's activities, but outside of Blenheim's walls, so not our own employees. You know, that had been at 2000 pre-pandemic. It had dipped down quite sharply. It's back now at about 2,600. So we are seeing that rebound happen. And that implies to me there is a high level of public confidence. But when you look at domestic tourism, particularly the high value domestic tourism, it tends to be the more affluent UK uh, residents who do that extended staycation in the UK and they are probably less affected by the cost of living crisis than others. I also think you're only just starting to see the cost of living crisis kick in. Much of the high value tourism towards the end of last year had been pre-booked prior to the summer when people felt rather more affluent and frankly were bouncing out of pandemic. So I think this for next six months will be quite tough. I, I particularly think there were a lot of British people who had booked international holidays. They placed the booking in early 2022 they went abroad as planned in the summer, but by the time they got back, they were worried about the money they had spent yeah. and certainly starting to see those very large utility bills drop in and they were quite quiet. We did see, however, the very best tourist experience is still flourishing. So our Christmas, which is quite iconic, um, was pretty much at 2019 volume. That's why there's a question, is there not around this staycation idea, whether it's going to work? 
you've talked about your revenge tourism. I love that phrase. Uh, that, that are people going to travel or are people going to stay at home? What will they do? Um, so my prediction, firstly, is the biggest impact in, in UK tourism will be international inward arrivals. I think you're going to see quicker recovery than any of us imagines. I reckon we'll be... Yeah, or, or, it, it will be three quarters of the way to full recovery this year on that international. On the domestic side, I am quite quite positive, but I think it's been driven by a, a different factor, which I think there's an increasing awareness of the carbon impact of of flying abroad, and I think that's catching on in the UK more than elsewhere. So I think there are many affluent families who will now say, well, they'll, they'll probably end up taking half the number of foreign holidays they ever did. And we will see the benefit of that this year. I, I think we will be um, at absolutely normal levels for British domestic staycation tourism this year, and we'll be catching up very fast on international. Let's look at the, the sort of big issues around the industry. The availability of a suitably skilled workforce in the leisure and tourism industry looks to be a major problem. Vacancies across the sector unfilled. Just under 29,000 people currently employed in the visitor economy compared to 42,000 pre-pandemic. What's happened to all these people, Dominic? Well, I think on a practical level, many of them have gone back to Europe. And yeah, it was- Is that a Brexit, Brexit thing? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. It was a disruptive moment. It doesn't really matter politically what people thought of it, which way they voted. For Europeans who were, who were building lives where they came to train and and make money in in the UK without necessarily planning it to be an always thing. Yet yeah, many of those went back because of the uncertainty, um, either because they were uncertain whether they would have a right to work or because they were worried that they would not be able to secure accommodation. And we and that's not just in tourism. We we lots of our tenants in our properties were researchers from the university, for example, and they weren't getting grants and, and things renewed for their work. So I think a lot, we, we had quite a European um, colorful mix in, in our workforce. And we saw that in all the other uh, tourist locations that we dealt with regularly. They went back and they haven't been fully replaced at all. Now, yeah, Blenheim, we count our blessings at Blenheim. We have a fiercely loyal workforce and an awful lot of people who've worked for us for a long time and we were able to help many people stay. Uh, but yeah, the days of yeah, tourist jobs being low paid and not having any obvious career development structure have had to stop. In, in a way, that system was propped up by the flow of cheap student labour out of Europe. Uh, today, it's really important both that we pay properly for these roles, but also that we offer training gateways so that people can make a career out of tourism. It's not that first job you do while you make up your mind. But, but we've still got those, those vacancies and wages have gone up in the sector. So it's not that simple then, just raise the money and they will come. Uh, well, uh, yeah, I think it's actually the development profile that's important. So what used to happen in many ways in tourism was young students would come and do the sort of dirty work for reasonably low pay, especially in key tourist periods, summer holidays, you weren't studying. Um, then they would go back and the current staff would take the strain, but the volume of work would be lower, so that, that would work. We now have to hold on to those students who come to us and pay them a lot more. We've had to invest a lot in um, the, the way we deliver an offer. Sometimes it has to be a more people light offer. If you think about even something like Christmas at Blenheim, which is you know a large displays, light trails and things, yeah, in terms of employees, per thousand visitors it's a more efficient offer in some ways than old-fashioned guiding around a palace so we've had to invest massively into that and we see that happening right across the country you you get uh tourist attractions to survive move into mass experience which is much more efficient in its labor usage and actually has the economics to pay a proper wage and that's one of the adjustment points we see out in our market is that those particularly parts of the support economy, I mean, I'm thinking of catering, bed and breakfasts, uh, all, all these kind of things, those which were fundamentally priced to be dependent on cheap labour are having to adjust. And that's one of the things driving inflation right around our market is that all these places are having to put up their prices. It's not just because the cost of power went up or the cost of raw materials went up, it's because they're having to pay properly for people. But there will be a balance point there because people won't pay the prices 
if it gets to a, a certain level, they'll just say, I can't afford to go. Which drives the investment cycle for particularly larger tourist businesses that they will have to invest into the mass offer, which can be delivered. I won't say in a people like basis because we employ more people today than we ever did, but per thousand visitors. It's, it's more efficient and that allows us also to offer proper career progression and training right through all of our businesses um, and, and that encourages people to stay. So where we do have people, instead of having to manage a cycle of people leaving, being recruited, retrain, lost experience and that, actually we retain all of that. And if we've got a good person, I don't care what role they want to do and what development they want, we'll, we'll do that because once you've got a good person, you don't want to let them go. Just before we develop uh, the, the career progression uh, idea, should there be a, a change of policy by the government to allow more people to come into this country to take the sort of jobs you were talking about there that, that are disappearing? It, it's difficult to answer that without, without being overly political, but there's a very practical point in tourism that a large part of our market is European tourism. And if you want to attract visitors and make them feel comfortable, you have to reflect the audience you want. So what is wonderful about employing French students and German students and Italian students and Indian students, etc., is that that audience comes with them and feels comfortable and absolutely at home at Blenheim. And that's a big trick for us. We need people to feel they are part of Blenheim, not they've been allowed to touch this you know, untouchable place briefly. We want them to feel at home. And so for me, I think it's hugely important to allow the free movement of workers of that age, at the very least, so that they gain international experience and we reflect those yeah, that within our staff and we attract the visitors that come with them. For me, that's crucially important. I think more broadly, I, I, yeah, we tend to think on, uh, yeah, we, we are quite local in our thinking. We're hyper-focused on the local area and we tend to want to figure out things for themselves. So when whenever I think the answer is more help from government, I recoil from that as a statement slightly. Yeah, we are big enough and ugly enough and lucky enough, for all the reasons I mentioned at the beginning, to be able to look after ourselves. Let's uh, explore that career progression. Uh, and you've already talked about your 10-year goals. Uh, delighted that we've got a colleague of yours uh, with us, Dominic. A very warm Ox Talks welcome to Kelly Huggard, who's uh, an apprentice at Blenheim Palace in the HR department. Yep. Tell us about your day-to-day. -day. Well, what's it like? Uh, so a bit like Dom said earlier on, arriving at the office, I too tend to stand and admire for a little while and then make my way in. Um, I basically sort of I'm in charge of the HR inbox, if you like. So that's my, my go-to. Um, we love a tracker in the HR team. So I check all the trackers, any new starters, levers, changes, that kind of thing. Um, and then it's about just sort of talking to everybody, really, and engaging the other teams. And uh, we've got a massive sharing a sense of belonging program at Blenheim. I do a lot of work on that. Um, we run activities, trying to pull teams together and um, just spend some time to it with each other, really. And this is not your first apprenticeship, is it? Uh, I know you're HR now, but uh, you've had an apprenticeship before and you're a chef at one stage. Yeah, so I, my, uh, my old career, if you like, uh, yeah, I was a chef for 17 years, I Where think. Where was that? So um, mostly at the Manor Hospital in Headington. Um, Nobody eats hospital food, though, do they? Yeah, they did at the time. <laughs> they did at the time. Uh, yes, yeah, so I did a business admin course. Um, I started that in November 2019. So, yeah. Um, and then COVID hit. I finished that virtually, which was quite interesting. Um, and then approached Megan, who is my current uh, director, about doing an apprenticeship with her. And yeah, here I am. And what inspires you? Um, from a work point of view, I think probably my team, the things that Emma and Megan have achieved together in the last few years are, are just absolutely brilliant. Um, I think the culture and the environment help they really align to my own values, the way that I see things. Um, and probably personally, I've got two girls, uh, my husband, who's by far my biggest supporter. Um, I'm quite honest, I didn't do particularly well in school. It wasn't really for me. Um, I don't shy away from that. And occasionally I might have some imposter syndrome and Jordan will ground me and you know, he's really good at, at making me realise that actually, if you put yourself out there and you're willing to try and do it, then then why not? And, and you know, who, who says you can't? Well, I think you've got another fan, aside from your husband, actually. Dominic, <laughs> uh, Kelly really inspires you too. Yes, she does. Um, she, she 
it's wonderful to hear her talking about imposter syndrome because we don't on the whole and i feel it all the time uh, i look around when i walk into the office at people doing extraordinary things and pushing beyond their comfort zone to make more of themselves and kelly absolutely epitomizes that in particular i say going from apprenticeship one to apprenticeship two you using this space and she absolutely is a credible contender for the top level in hr if that's what she wants to do um she also i have to say is brilliant at crafting as well and she last last christmas she was supervising a workshop was all making wreaths and things like that and she does not realize how multi-talented she is and how many people that inspires and i'm sure it isn't just jordan i, I think your girls um, brie and amelie are probably incredibly proud of you too so what is the dream uh, where do you see yourself going with this uh so from now, from now, sort of next couple of years, it's to do my um, COPD level five apprenticeship with Blenheim. Um, my game at the moment, or aim, sorry, at the moment is to go for the HR advisor role, which I'm currently working on. Um, and so then, this yeah, is sort of taking knows? your boss's job, basically. Yeah. Uh, well, Emma's just been promoted, but oh, I'll okay. take the one that she's just she just <laughs> left. Yeah, but I suppose yeah, end, end game. Um, I don't have any intentions of leaving anytime soon. I absolutely love working at, at Blenheim and, uh, you know, maybe Megan should be a bit afraid. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Dominic, well, watch out as well. You never know. <laughs> Grace, that's a lovely story. Thank you for sharing no that, that with us, so, Kelly. Great to meet you. Um, best of luck with your, your career and Thank keep you. on inspiring the boss. It can't be a bad thing. Let's explore, Dominic, more about the, the big issues hitting the sector uh, currently. Is the labour shortage the sector's biggest problem or the cost of doing business uh, causing more issues from from your side of things? Well, I think the labour problem is the biggest cost problem, really, for most of us. I know utility bills are also high and it's, I'm embarrassed to admit, you know, Blenheim has you know, a fixed gas and electricity deal running till back end of this year, which means we've not suffered in the same way as many businesses. But I think how much, labor, it, how much does it cost to, to heat a palace? Well, we spend um, heating the palace and the parkland or other buildings attached to the palace um, around about £300,000 a year. And that, that would, if we were floating in the market in our purchasing, that would have perhaps uh, multiplied by two and a half. Whoa. It hasn't happened that way and it won't. We're lucky by the time we come off that fix, we will be generating more solar energy across the year than we use by a factor of two, which is a relief. Um, otherwise, we could be quite nervous. We've also done some very innovative restoration. So we're replacing the orangery roof, um, which was thermally invisible in its old form. I, I remember being in there. It's, yeah, you, you need a few layers on. You, you do. It's not even waterproof, which you would think was a, a fundamental requirement of a roof. But anyway, it is being replaced in a really innovative piece of restoration in conjunction with Historic England to a thermally efficient roof roof that will give a lot more protection. But for most tourist businesses, including Blenheim, um, labour is by far the biggest cost component and it's quite existential. Um, you know, we're lucky we, we, we are attractive enough as an employer to open year round still, but the number of pubs and restaurants and places like that I see with fairly permanent signs up saying kitchen open, Wednesday to Sunday or you know from six till ten or something that never happened in the, that never happened in the old days uh, and that is not even necessary they can't afford the labor they can't get it full stop they might you know they're advertising desperately for the chefs or the, the kitchen porters or the waiting staff but they, they just can't they just can't get them and it's very frustrating to see us all scaled back in that way and you know we have such a vibrant tourist ecosystem in terms of all the businesses who contribute and benefit from it to see us strangled back like that it, it hurts everyone and you wonder how quickly we'll get that back um you know some large places like us can in, in a way take the long view in some ways but but if but if you are relying on being open at x time and having staff serving things or delivering things and they're not there your business strinks permanently. Well, the, the pubs you mentioned uh, it literally isn't worth having the heating on. Is no. it? That, that's the point. Uh, I mean, just just help us understand that the heating bills at, at Blenheim. Then, so what what are we 
talking about to, to heat a palace and, and how does it work with you guys uh, well we, we have a combination of of gas and electricity um we have a plan to generate it all ourselves and in terms of electricity we will be generating more than we need by august this year um we we actually have planning consent to build a, a lake source heat pump to heat the palace but the technology is not quite there yet for us to execute on this it. is heat thing. under the lake well, lake water will, yes, absolutely. If, uh, the, the, the bed of the lake will always be warmer than the air around it, except high summer. Um, it's a very efficient way of heating. It works in the same way as an air source heat pump or, or, or an, uh, a ground source heat pump, but we can do that. Um, but palaces are inherently incredibly difficult to heat huge void spaces windows and frames that are that thick <laughs> I, sorry that's great radio this is yeah, 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 yeah. okay. <laughs> i'm talking a very small number of millimeters in some cases the windows are almost so thin you worry you could push your finger through it roofs as you've experienced in the past howard that are thermally invisible um it is very very difficult to heat those things efficiently uh, we've only just moved away from a steam driven system and if you think about a steam driven heating system you don't have to really have done a lot of physics beyond o level to realize that steam only exists at 100 degrees uh, therefore you can put a lot of effort in and get no heating and then suddenly you've got it all you, your system's hit 100 degrees it all pours out now imagine you're using that as a heating system for a place that's full of priceless por portraits paintings tapestries the most amazing decoration. I tell you, the conservation manual for these things does not say heat at either zero or 100 degrees. In fact, the complete opposite. So it's very, very hard work and inefficient to do. And But we have to simply do that as efficiently as we can because preserving those buildings as they are is crucially important. What Blenheim can't do is say, let's go to a new build in Wiltshire. Yeah, We are where we are and we have to care for it and we have to ensure one way or the other that we make the money from our businesses to pay for that kind of heating. Businesses have not had the help, uh, well they've had some help from the government but if you like the, there is a very clear line in the sand. Should there be greater government help for businesses to literally keep the, the heating and the lighting on? Uh, I, absolutely, I, I think it is tragic that relatively, we have to hope these are relatively short-term factors about utilities for example could shut down viable businesses in their tracks that's that's quite unfair on ever so many levels and we did see a government in a not too distant past that decided to do whatever it took to support as many businesses and employers as possible through the pandemic and i appreciate that's taken a dent out of national wealth but uk national debt is not excessive by most measures internationally and while we continue to have extremely high and in many cases unaffordable heating costs, I, I would urge government to intervene more aggressively. Every good business that goes down just because the price of electricity or gas changed, that's a national tragedy, it really is. And it, it breaks real people. It's not just inconvenient for the economic ecosystem. These are real business owners, in many cases, who put their their life into these businesses and have taken risks to employ people and contribute to the economy and and they're having it snatched away and it, it you know i think we all believe that collectively this is not the pricing level for gas and electricity in the future um but but most businesses don't have the strength to to, to carry on in the same way so i i think they absolutely deserve help Leona Weston is Oxlep's marketing campaigns executive. Good to see you. Uh, you've picked up some questions from our social channels and elsewhere uh, and I'm going to throw them into the mix. Uh, what, what are people saying? Yeah, so thank you to our excellent followers on social media for the following questions. We continue to encourage you to send in your comments for future podcasts. Um, so the first question that we've got for you today, Dominic, is do you think, as a county, we are truly aware of how fortunate we are to have the visitor economy we have? For example, our great location geographically, so one hour from London, one hour from Birmingham, and home to one of the most iconic cities in the world. That's an interesting one. I think many people who move to Oxford or many businesses that choose to start up or relocate to Oxfordshire do recognise that. When you look at why they're making the choices they make, this is exactly about 
you know, the, the, the powerful research institutions producing incredible IP and highly trained individuals to join the workforce. It is about thinking, where can we where can we persuade a thousand people or a hundred people to come and live and enjoy ourselves? And of course, Oxford has this amazing cultural backdrop in terms of world heritage sites, but also theatres, amazing shopping. If you think about it, yeah, a, 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 a conurbation the size of Oxford wouldn't normally have a John Lewis and a Westgate even. You know, we, we, we are boosted by that economy. So I think many people making active choices to come to our area absolutely get it. Do those who are already there always appreciate it no absolutely not and and that's a very human thing that that tourism is not without consequence i think we always need to work hard as local authorities as oxlep as experience oxygen and as the big tourist attractions to try and ensure that the upside of tourism is always always felt in terms of employment and economic contribution and supporting great facilities that local people want to access but we want to make sure we don't crowd out local people and sometimes in oxford you get this moment where it is so busy in the summer with tourists that local people don't feel particularly comfortable there. Um, they can't sort of sit down at their normal coffee shop that they're aware of how busy it is. Um, and that's where explain to people the, the tourism, that these facilities are year round things to enjoy, that actually the number of local people who are aware of the Western Library, of the Sheldonian, of the amazing concerts, the theatres of Blenheim and all these other places, but haven't actually been to them because they, they regard it as tourist fair. We have to lure them in too so that they get the same benefits. I don't think local people are aware enough of it, but but I think there's a responsibility on us in the business to ensure that we balance tourism and local people. And the key to that, in my opinion, is staycation. It is multi-day visits and proper dispersal across an amazing county so that what we don't get is, at one extreme, the two-hour shotgun coach visit to the centre of Oxford, not even time to buy a cup of coffee in some cases. Um, coaches engine running on St. Giles. You know, that's where you don't want to be. Where you want to be is people saying, this area, we're going to come and stay in for three or four nights. We're going to explore the whole county, not just the honeypot of the centre of Oxford, Blenheim and Bicester Village, but we're going to go to Didcot Railway Museum, we're going to go to the Long Hambra Bus Museum, we're going to go to the Oxford Artisan Distillery. Uh, yeah, we're going to do all these things. And of course, the economic impact of that is much, much better because they're not just spending money in a quick burst in shops, they're spending money in the nighttime economy. Every, every meal they will eat out, they will find things to do in the evening and that's really, really important. And of course, the, their traffic impact on the centre is vastly less because they're not driving in and out the whole time. Thank you. Um, and another thing that a number of our followers have been commenting on um, is your recent documentary on Christmas at Blenheim. So it sort of showcases the palace, but also what it's like to work in the sector. Um, do we collectively need to do more to create similar awareness of what it's like to develop a career in the sector and truly how successful you can be working in tourism and related sectors? Absolutely, we have to do more. Uh, like I said before, employment in tourism tended to fall into two groups. So with the students supporting their studies by working in, you know, in the holidays in between, and then there would often be a gap to much older people uh, working in later parts of life and, and very little in between. We have to showcase examples like Kelly, but also people like Nicole, who I think was Apprentice of the Year a couple of years ago, and many others to show how they have gone through. They have started on the shop floor, they're now doing degrees in tourist management, working partly at Blenheim of Places. This has to be replicated elsewhere because tourism and, and looking after people is what a great job we do. We get paid to help people have a great time, to help them have family and social experiences, to help them make memories. We get paid to do that. You know, I'd probably do that for free. Don't tell anyone. Oh God, <laughs> I so wish I hadn't said that. It's a joy. You're at the center of people's happiest moments. And we have to show people that they can make a joyful living doing that. It isn't just a question of, you'll always be working in X location. You can go from place to place, you can go up the hierarchy, you can learn more and more. And it's really important for us that we attract the best people at the bottom and that we don't let them go. Not, not because we enforce a 12 month uh, notice period, but because they want to stay. They see themselves growing, they see their peers growing, they form a community and they are growing together. And if you add that the, to that, the efforts we make to create truly affordable housing and things like that, they get to see that in this incredibly affluent part of the world, they can live the life they yearn for, grow families, live a full life. 
based in careers in tourism. I think that's incredibly important. And tourism is such a rich and varied offer. Uh, I don't know anyone working in tourism who doesn't love it. Leona and Dominic, thank you both for the moment. We'll chat again shortly. It's good to have you along for Ox Talks, the brand new podcast series powered by the Oxfordshire Local Enterprise Partnership. If you want to get in touch with the team at Oxlep to comment on what you've been hearing, find us on social media. We're on Twitter at Oxfordshire Lep or via LinkedIn, search for Oxfordshire Local Enterprise Partnership. Perhaps you run a company or organisation that is just looking for some specific help or simply need a steer to the most appropriate business advice available. Why not try the Oxlep Business Support Tool? Oxlep's Business Support Tool is here to help your company. Whether you're just starting out, growing or ready to take on a new business challenge. If you're looking for the latest advice and support, Complete our business support tool today and get set to receive a bespoke action plan for your organisation. Head to OxfordshireLEP.com to find out more. Let's chat more to Dominic Hare from uh, Blenheim Palace. How are the local authorities responding, Dominic, to the evolving financial picture in this sector? They are all under huge strain is the first thing to say, um, all the things that affect us affect them too. They're not the kind of insured counterparty. They are struggling to employ people. They are struggling to heat their offices. They are struggling to deliver the services that as, as citizens we we expect them to deliver. Um, I have to say I'm, 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 I'm pretty impressed by the way they and government have supported us. I mean, just to hark back to the pandemic, you know, particularly tourism actually, really well supported, whether it was through furlough or lower rates of VAT or significant grant programs. Um, they have worked very, very hard um, to support businesses affected. Um, and I'm constantly impressed by the innovation they are trying to show in supporting us all now. And there are you know, modest grant programs, etc., mainly aimed at businesses much smaller than Blenheim. And they're very quick and energetic to get those out. Um, having said that, their hands are pretty well tied by financial availability. You know, they have um, decreasing resources in real terms. And, and, and yeah, without being political about it, of course, that's because generally speaking, the country doesn't want to invest more in in um, taxes, which is where, where they get their funding from. So yeah, I have to say we have a, 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 you know, a group of current leaders across Oxfordshire who are focusing, I think, rightly on, on sustainable living, sustainable business, and in our case, sustainable tourism, and demanding more more from us in that. And we're very happy to play our role there. Um, some of those things will make life more difficult in the short run. Um, I think quite rightly, you see you see councils looking to restrict the, the petrol and diesel motor car from free movement everywhere. I think that's where we have to go, but let's not pretend, particularly for those businesses in the centre of Oxford, that's a challenge for them at at this moment when they face already labour and utility challenges. I, I, I would urge them to have some more understanding there, but the direction of travel they're going in, I think most of us would accept we have to get there one way or another. Is the current economic climate affecting investment in the tourism sector? Um, for the businesses that I know, and of course that, that is more the larger businesses, it is forcing us to invest more on the whole. I, I certainly in large businesses see no shortage investment. In fact, to make good occasional labour shortfalls, we have no choice but to invest more. Blenheim in the last five years has invested more into its tourist businesses into the offer than probably the previous 15. And I don't think we're that unusual in our sector in, in, in doing that. I think at a lower level, it is really difficult to invest when you're having to limit your opening hours because you can't pay the few bills and can't find the staff. That's really, really hard. And it's difficult to see how they can be helped unless there's another you know, grant program of the likes of the, cult the Culture Recovery Fund or something like that, but aimed more at small businesses. Let's talk about the help that, that has been available and, and is available. Um, Oxleps, uh, Leona Weston is, is here. Tell us about how Oxlep has been supporting the Oxfordshire visitor economy through a, it's a new programme and, and a supporting grant scheme. Yeah, so our visitor economy renaissance programme, it's a £1.6 million programme of activity um, to help ultimately support businesses in the sector as they emerge from the pandemic, um, whilst also increasing footfall into the county. Um, 
So the programme is made up of several strands, including working with our destination management organisations, so Experience Oxfordshire and Cotswolds Tourism, um, to ultimately promote the county. Um, we've also recently committed around £650,000 worth of grants to small businesses in the visitor economy sector and subsectors sub within the county um, to ultimately try and boost the sector whilst also continuing to support our business community. And there's also been some crucial funding secured by Oxlip from the Local Growth Fund. Worth explaining what that is and where the money was invested. Yeah, so I think it's, it's probably worth saying that as a local enterprise partnership, we see it as really important to support our key sectors, um, in particular the pipeline of talent that goes into those key sectors, um, particularly areas such as our visitor economy. Um, an area where we've supported our pipeline of talent in this sector in particular is we secured £2.1 million from government funding, so the Local Growth Fund, to go into Activate Learning's hospitality training suite, which is ultimately set up with state-of-the-art facilities to inspire young people to go into the sector, but also really highlight the value of the sector to Oxfordshire as a county. Dominic, what's your reaction to what Leanne has been saying? It's fantastic news, and that's a good example, a great example even, of where they are stepping in, where the small businesses that, that will benefit it just can't afford to. Uh, it, it's bad news for Kelly because she'll have to go back into chefing, I reckon. <laughs> but no, it, it's brilliant news. Uh, it's exactly well targeted. And yeah, I can say, well, Blenheim doesn't get that, but we don't need it. It would probably be a, a diversion of much needed resource if it went to us. We have had um, help, though, um, as well towards our apprenticeship training. So I, I believe we've just received some money coordinated by Oxlep from unspecified apprenticeship levy elsewhere which is now being rooted and it will be used astonishingly effectively by us i mean every single pound will 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 buy many pounds worth of of brilliant training resource so we're hugely grateful for that let's try and round up your your thoughts from our conversation there's obviously been a post-pandemic recovery maybe not quite to the levels where we were before but um, we are where we are what would be your top three things you would either change or want to sort of get in place to, to help this sector really go forward? Well, I think the first thing is a quick resolution or a quicker resolution we've seen so far for tourist visas. Um, at the moment, there's a very quick process for international visitors to get a visa across the whole of the EU and a slower process to get access to the UK. And that is simply a massive competitive disadvantage as international tourism recovers. We have an attractive offer, but at the end of the day, if we make it really hard for individual tourists and group tourists to get that visa, they'll take the very easy EU option because it turns out there are nice places to visit in other countries too. Um, the second thing is I would love to see more flexibility in um, you know, cross Europe employment for young people. I mean, I'm talking, you know, early 20s, that kind of thing. They were not just a cheap resource, but a brilliant part of the lifeblood of our employment and the way we welcome European visitors too. Uh, they gave us so much and it, it's sad to see them gone. And in the short run, we do have a labour shortfall. There is no easy way of plugging that without that resource uh, coming in. Um, number three, I, I yeah, it is just a general point that, that yeah, we are lucky that as a landed estate, we have the resources to generate our own sustainable power in a way that decouples us from the pressure of external energy prices. But for so many businesses, it's not the case. And when you talk to some of them who are, who I, I think you mentioned before, are shutting at certain points because they can't afford to heat the place for that long, um, that's that's tragic, and we will lose businesses, great businesses, businesses that have been you know, the lives of the people who set them up, we're going to lose them because the electricity bill was for two or three years ridiculously high and that, that's just wrong. There is help out there, if you like, and, and clearly Oxlep have a, a part to play in this too. Uh, Oxlep have been a brilliant coordinator of that kind of resource. It's at a certain level, so I think they use it astonishingly effectively. Uh, difficult to look at it and say they could do more. Is it enough? I doubt anyone would claim it's enough to fill that gap. What about the, the sort of joined up thinking, the collaboration, if you like, um, between different sectors? Will, will that help the, the visitor economy really take big, bigger strides? When you say collaboration between different sectors, what are you thinking? D different, different parts of the economy. I mean, could, could you 
driverless electric vehicles whizzing around Blenheim, perhaps. I don't know. I, I tend to see it the other way around in that, that tourism is a key enabler and supporter of so many things we take for granted from underpinning the existence of the Westgate and John Lewis and all these places through to driving investment in transport um, for, for underpinning a wonderful array of restaurants and other cultural uh, yeah, attractions. Yeah, living, working in Oxford and Oxfordshire is massively enhanced by all those things that are underpinned by that 10% plus of the economy locally, which is tourism led and i know we can roll our eyes at the number of tourists sometimes but we live a vastly better life because of all those things we would not have all the transport connections all these life-affirming facilities around us if there wasn't tourism and we're proud to play our role in that you know uh you know that i think people have to take that with the frustration of too many tourists in summer occasionally a closing thought then dominic on whether the visitor economy is the key sector for all sectors i would probably expand the comment to say that we are what we are in this county because of the presence of two spectacularly good universities and the cultural and tourist sector. It is difficult to imagine this place being what it is without both of those. They define our history, they define life, they define employment opportunities for our young people, they define our reputation for innovation, which is something that Oxlap have, have driven so hard for. Um, they make this a truly unique location. I cannot think of anywhere else in the country that has such innovation, such vibrancy, such joy of life, so much opportunity. Where where the hell else would you want to live or bring up your kids? Uh, this is the place and both of those sectors are, are, are crucial for delivering that. Dominic Hare, thank you. And Kelly Huggard from Blenheim Palace too. Thanks also to Leona Weston from Oxlep. And thank you for listening to Ox Talks. This is the second podcast in the series, and we hope you'll tune into more over the coming weeks and months. Find us where you normally get your podcasts and please tell your friends or colleagues. And why not leave us a review? Feel free to share your thoughts and suggestions on our social media channels. It'll be good to hear from you. Remember, business support in Oxfordshire is just an email or a phone call away. The Oxlep Business Support Tool can signpost you to expert help in a matter of minutes. It's worth taking a look. Find it on our website, oxfordshirelep.com. Do tune in again to the series when we'll be discussing, amongst other things, how ESG can enhance your business, plus the thorny issue of finding and retaining talent. And if you didn't catch the first edition of Ox Talks, find out what Makespace Oxford's Andy Edwards is doing to repurpose buildings in the county to help level the playing field for disadvantaged communities. It is a fascinating listen. But for now, from the Oxlep team and from me, Howard Bentham, it's goodbye.